The Game Awards is having a massive controversy at the moment that we need to dive deep into and explain what the heck is going on. Oh, we have more going on because, you know, some days I forget who I am, but what I don't forget is that Nintendo is updating F-099. That's right, we have an update for F-099 for a lot of you classic F-0 fans out there. Oh, we're not done though because, you know, what's also racing right into the news? How about a Nintendo Switch Many. I kid you not, we have some actual documentation for a Nintendo Switch Mini that might be landing as soon as next year. And what does that have to do with Nintendo Switch 2? Some fun facts around that. Beyond all of that, you know how there's a lot of debate over the Game Awards and how who's going to win Game of the Year? Will it be Baldur's Gate 3? Will it be Tears of the Kingdom? A lot of people thinking it's going to be Baldur's Gate 3. But what if I were to tell you that Tears of the Kingdom was just given an award for literally being the greatest video game of all time? No, this isn't the Nintendo Prime Awards. I'm not, like, handing it. A hold on, hold on. Trophy? Here, here, here you go. That's for the, no, no, no that, that's, that's not what happened in here. An actual major company gave this award to Tears of the Kingdom. Don't know Nintendo accepted it or anything, but hey, it is something that we get to talk about today. <laughs> So first up, let's talk about the Dorito Pope himself, Mr. Jeff Keighley, because he finds himself in some hot water due to one of the categories at the Game Awards. Now, there's a few little updates he did give in a Q&A that he did recently, an interview where he talked about different aspects of how, like, how they're going to get rid of the world premiere stuff, which... Okay, they're not actually changing the content of the show. They're just not going to have the world premiere title card. So even though we're totally used to seeing that title card and then occasionally hearing world premiere, ah, we're not going to be hearing that anymore. Okay, cool, whatever. Fine, I guess you can get rid of that. Also, he talks about the security at the show and how they're upping it, but he doesn't really go into specific details because, of course, you don't want to give away the actual security details of the event to allow any, you know, people who want to get up on stage and do crazy things and talk about Bill Clinton. Hey, Martin. You know, real quick, I want to thank everybody and say that I think I want to nominate this award to uh, my reformed orthodox rabbi, Bill Clinton. Thank you, everybody. Oh, you don't want that to happen, so giving out security details publicly would actually allow for them to find loopholes in the security. So, again, I understand him not going into details of it, but I also understand the line of questioning because they've had people invade the stage now twice in back-to-back years. Now, setting all of that aside, that's not actually the controversy. Believe it or not, the controversy is with the awards themselves, which often are the least talked about thing heading into the Game Awards besides Game of the Year, and that is due to one category, that category being Best Indie Game. Now, Look, this is an amazing category and an important award category to recognize independent game studios. And yes, independent game studios are exactly what the word means. They're independent. They're not owned by a major corporation. They don't always self-publish their games, but they self-create, they self-fund, yada, 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 right? So it's pretty obvious what an independent game company is. Well, except to everyone but Jeff Keighley. And that is because a little game that uh, you might have heard of, Dave the Diver, is up for best indie game. The problem is, not the studio that made it, it is a small studio, and it's that the studio is owned by a $15 billion company. Actually, a $15 billion publisher. Yes, that would mean the studio is not an independent studio because they are owned by a mega corporation. Kind of crazy that that means the game is up for best indie game just because it's a smaller game with a smaller budget, but it's owned by a massive $15 billion company. So what are we talking about? Well, Jeff Keighley was asked about this, and he said the following. Look, it's a great question. Independent can mean different things to different people, and it's sort of a broad term. You can argue, does independent mean the budget of the game? Does independent mean where the source of the financing was? Does it mean the team size? Is it the kind of independent spirit, the game, meaning a smaller game that's sort of different? 
I think everyone has their own opinion about this, and we'll really defer to our jury of 120 global media outlets who vote on these awards to make that determination of is something independent or not. You know, in other industries, some things are, well, I think a film industry. The budget can't be above this amount of dollars or it's not independent. So I don't know. Some people have said Larian with Baldur's Gate 3, that's an independent game. Kojima Productions with Death Stranding, some people say that's an independent game. And even though that's an independent studio, of course it was funded by PlayStation. He then later pointed out that some are questioning that if an indie studio has a publisher, are they still independent or not? Now, I don't really know where the confusion is here, and Jeff Keighley kind of created this controversy on his own. He could have just passed us off as, hey, I don't get to make these decisions. They're decided by a panel of 120 people. This is what they decided should be included. We've never had a situation come up like this before where a game was maybe nominated in a category that it doesn't belong in, and we're going to have to look into maybe tightening the ship on future events because it's too late to do anything about it this time around. That would have been probably the correct corporate response, but that's not what he did. Instead, he just sort of defended the choice and basically said, hey, who am I to say what an independent game is? Well, let me tell you what an independent game is, Jeff Keighley, since you seem a little bit confused on what qualifies. An independent game is a game made by an independent studio that is not owned by a bigger corporation. Guys, this isn't rocket science. Dave the Diver, in hindsight, should not be allowed to be up for this award. And it's going to be extremely awkward if it actually wins the award. Now, Dave the Diver, by the way, is a very good game. We're not knocking the game. It's just if it wins this award, it'll be the first non-independent studio to win an independent studio award. Now, I know what you're thinking. The Dorito Pope is full of controversy. And I'm over here rocking an award from the Game Awards that... uh. Eric actually won. Yeah, this is Eric's trophy. He beat me in the Game Awards last year. We'll talk about that. It's a bit of a betting special. But here's the thing. I actually don't care about that. What I care is that you subscribe to the channel and drop a like. And uh, thank you for helping us get closer to our goal of 150,000 subscribers. Now, what if I were to tell you that Nintendo may be releasing a Nintendo Switch Mini next year? Would you believe me? Would you call me a liar? Would you say I'm just making this up and believing the rumor train out there? What if I were to tell you it's actually not a rumor at all and Nintendo has done this before? In fact, they did it with the Wii and they did it with the Game Boy Advance, and they might be doing it again, and this time, all the information we have on it comes directly from Nintendo. Now, this is basically just due to a bunch of patent hunting. Nintendo has released a ton of patents. I believe it's five total patents surrounding a device that looks like a miniature Nintendo Switch. It has a cartridge slot. It has some similar internal designs to the Nintendo Switch, including this fan-style blower. It's got a lot of things that look very, very similar to a Nintendo Switch, except the characteristic that mentions it's a miniaturized version. And look, Nintendo has done these mini consoles in the past, but there's some interesting parts about it. The Game Boy Micro, when it came out, uh, came out in 2005, after the Nintendo DS had already launched in 2004. But it gets better because Nintendo's done these micro consoles before, like the Wii Mini. The Wii Mini came out in December of 2012, a few weeks after the launch of the Wii U. That's right, Nintendo tends to launch these miniaturized versions of systems after the next system gets here. Now look, one big thing here is because these patents exist, uh, it's highly unlikely that this particular device, the way it's described, is going to release. Nintendo said that themselves. When these patents go public, these are like things we're not going to do, and that's fine, or at least it's not going to come out in the way the patents suggest. Now, this could have just been a prototype, and they have a separate prototype that patents haven't come up for yet, and maybe that version of the Nintendo Switch Mini is what's going to release next year. Why do they do these miniaturized things? Well, they're cheaper, and you might go, well, we already have the Switch Lite. Yeah, it would be even smaller than the Switch Lite. It would probably be a pocketable version of Nintendo Switch. It will take cartridges and it'll probably be like a hundred bucks. It's a way to have a super cheap option out there once the new system launches. So there is a possibility we get the Nintendo Switch 2 next year and then shortly after they still launch a new version of Nintendo Switch. Again, because these patents are out there, this is probably a canceled product, but it doesn't mean a similar product with different patents that aren't public yet 
doesn't exist. So Nintendo was at least playing around with the idea of a Nintendo Switch Mini, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see if they decide to do anything with it. There's some interesting parts in these patents too, like a magnetic cover that also attaches to the back. Kind of interesting. Maybe that would be because it's meant to be put in your pocket to help protect the control sticks and stuff. Sort of interesting some of the design choices Nintendo was looking into this prototype system. Next up, did you know Tears of the Kingdom is apparently the greatest video game ever made? Now look, if you've been following my channel for any length of time, you'll know that Tears of the Kingdom is literally my favorite game of all time. So you could argue that this is me grabbing Eric's award and handing it to Tears of the Kingdom. Hey man, you're the greatest game ever made. Well, except it's not my award and I'm not the one that called the game that in this instance. Actually, you know what company decided that it is the greatest game ever made? Pringles, I, I, I kid you not. Pringles has awarded Tears of the Kingdom with the grand gesture of being the greatest video game ever made. I don't even, what do you even say? Uh, what, what does Pringles, I mean, look, gamers eat Pringles, I'm sure. People eat Pringles, so like we eat chips, we eat snacks. Like, I guess I get the connection. Uh, don't know, between the Dorito Pope today, Pringles handing out greatest game of all time awards. Look, Tears of the Kingdom should just be a shoe in for game of the year, right? Pringles is saying it's the greatest video game ever made. Has to win game of the year then. It'd be ironic if Pringles gave game of the year to Baldur's Gate 3 while calling this. I Look, I don't know if they're at, look, this is just, look, Pringles handed out an award. Whether Nintendo accepted it or not, beats me. Could have just been for internet clout or attention, I don't know. Now lastly, we gotta zoom zoom in because F099 got an update today and I believe it drops tomorrow in Europe. Update 1.1.0. Now this is a classic mode and it's interesting because they did announce back in October they were done adding tracks to the game. So a lot of people thought, oh, we're gonna be done updating it. Well, they never said they were done adding modes. This classic mode literally brings the aspect ratio down to 4-3 because that's how we played back on the Super Nintendo and also limits it to only 20 players like the original game did when there was only 20 racers. They disabled the spin attack and they also disabled the Skyway. Also, you're completely limited to only one boost move per lap. So yeah, this is just like the original game. It's basically just bringing it back down to the classic style of what F-Zero, this version of it used to be. And I think this will help obviously increase player bases today. It has been a bit hard to get a full 99 racers in a game at any time, unless you were playing on weekends or certain nights. Uh, and now it, this is probably going to pack the lobbies again here for the next you know, week or so. I'm just glad to see F-Zero down again continue to get some support. I wouldn't suspect we're gonna get any more updates to the game. Then again, we didn't anticipate this update, so who knows, maybe there will be more modes added to the game in the future. I just hope they don't press delete on it the way they did with Super Mario 35. I'm kinda tired of these limited time additions to NSO that we're just gonna remove and act like that's still adding value. Like, why don't we still have Super Mario 35 again? I'm confused. Why would you remove value from NSO? That's not really how you keep subscribers. Just say it. I mean, I know they have 38 million of them, but whatever. Anyways, guys, I'm just glad that I'm still here. Yes, it's true. If you saw our last episode, uh, Grandpa Prime over there did save me from the Nintendo Ninjas for today. We'll see if Grandpa Prime has to step in on another episode, but today we're doing all right, folks. Thank you so much for being here, and I'll catch you in the next episode.